of the world's trade union movement and welcome to an afternoon planning our campaign to free Europe of nuclear weapons with the emphasis on the practical. Uh, I'm Owen Tudor, Deputy General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, which has 200 million members around the world, many of them in our pan-European region, which stretches from the Azores in the Atlantic to Vladivostok on the Pacific. Uh, I'm introducing this event because we were due to have it in the International Trade Union Confederation headquarters in Brussels, and I'm sorry we can't have an in-person gathering uh, maybe next year, because what a year it has already been. As our Jewish friends bid goodbye to their year, Shana Tova to them, by the way, we have, of course, seen the impact of the COVID pandemic. Yet another reminder, if such were needed, that nuclear weapons are not an answer to any of the key threats we face. We've had the 75th anniversary of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings, and I'm glad to see Dr. Yamamoto on the call today. And we have also seen the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons Edge ever closer to entering into force, which we hope it will do early in 2021 if more states ratify at the UN General Assembly later this month. Especially good to see Ireland and Malta from our region sign up this summer and congratulations to everyone who was involved in making that happen. The International Trade Union Confederation has just released last week the results of our global poll of people's attitudes conducted in 20 countries around the world before the pandemic really struck, but giving us an insight into the old normal, the base that we're starting from. We found that 42% of respondents were worried about the risk of nuclear war, and it was above 50% in five of the 20 countries we studied worldwide, although only one of them was in Europe, and that was Bulgaria. And we found 64% of people thought their government should be doing more with other countries to promote peace, with 53% more likely to trust their government if they committed to an international treaty to ban nuclear weapons. Trust was a major issue in our poll, or the lack of it. In some ways, those are promising levels to build from, but they show we still have a lot to do to win the argument with people, let alone with politicians and with governments. So let's use today to work out how to do that. And I pledge the support of the trade union movement in doing that, starting with our own members and working people more generally, in particular by making the links between peace, the need for funding for adequate public services, and for social justice. Let's get to it. And I hand over to someone who's going to explain the technology before we start our debates. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Hello, Hello everyone. everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm sure all of you are well accustomed to uh, using Zoom and the hands. Uh, so for this meeting, we are going to be using the hand symbol uh, function. If you want to speak, uh, you can see here. Uh, if you want, if you don't know how to raise your hand, first you click on participants. Uh, then you go to uh, the little three dots at the bottom right, uh, and there you will find raise hand, and that will bring up a little blue hand, so we all know that you want to speak. Uh, it can also be in a little box like this if you have the participation participants there. Same thing, three little dots, click it, raise hand. That simple. Uh, we will try to get to you all in the order that you raise your hands, but apologies if, uh, if it's a little bit out of order, but uh, we will do our best on that end. Uh, and that's everything. So uh, back to the meeting. Yeah, dear colleagues and dear friends, Lucas and myself will give a short overview about the developing of our campaign. You know, the background of our campaign for Europe without nuclear weapons was the discussion that we have on one side two nuclear weapons countries on our continent and that we have these US nuclear weapons in five countries. And that our belief was that there is not enough engagement activities against 
nuclear weapons in Europe. So we want to organize a specific support on one side for the ban treaty and on the other side for a general abolishing of nuclear weapons and in enlarging the activities in Europe. We want to continue what's happened in the 80s. European nuke END is maybe one of the key words for the campaign in the 80s. And that is the background we are now uh, starting this campaign. The campaign was opened with a, somewhere has some notes. Can you mute yourself? Because I can hear myself double. Okay. And so we start, we develop the text and start with this campaign. And we want to start the campaign with the broad coalition. That is the first step we have done with the broad coalition of international organizations. We are very happy that we could welcome from the beginning the International Trade Union Confederation, that we could engage Pax Christi, that we could engage the National Network of Energies and Scientists, Yalana, and others for this campaign, but also got the support of male national organizations like CND in Great Britain and Mouvement de la Paix in France. And we start the campaign with a signature campaign and the discussion about common actions. And my colleague Lucas will speak a little bit later about the website, which is a key element for spreading the information for our whole campaign. And at that point, we start in the coordinating committee the discussion, what can we do for getting more support for the campaign? What could be common actions and activities? And the idea was to have a meeting in Brussels today where we want to discuss the common activities for the year 2021 against the military bases of the United States and Europe, a nuclear military bases, and for supporting the whole campaign. And that is the main reason, the background of the event today. Let me summarize, we start collecting signatures. This is not very successful up to now. We only have a small amount of signatures, so there's a lot of to do to get more signatures in the different countries. Start to develop more supporting organizations. There we are much more successful, but also we have quite no success from the East and Central European countries up to now. This is also a very open point for the future. This includes also that the Scandinavian countries are quite missing in our campaign. And third, we start the discussion about future activities, and that is the background for today. And I would love to give to hand over now to Lucas to explain the website and the role of the website for our campaign. Thank you, Rainer. Um, I think you all know the website. It's nukefreeeurope.eu. Um, for me, it's a starting point now. It's basically the business card of our campaign. Um, we try to make it look uh, decent or nice, as good as we could. Um, and it has several elements besides uh, signing the appeal and listing the supporters and listing uh, the initiators, um, which on, I think, all three levels we could uh, achieve more. We, we need more supporters. We need more, definitely much more signatures. We have 473 as of 20 minutes ago. So if you have not signed it yet by whatever reason, maybe you forgot, so please do so. Um, um, on the website, we have um, a uh, category which is uh, activities and actions and um, information. I think there are already a lot of uh, good websites with uh, calendars of activities. So um, maybe we, we should see how to integrate uh, um, existing calendars into our website so that we don't have to do double work. But I think it's uh, um, the, the big advantage or the, the, for me the important thing of this campaign is that uh, we uh, generate international or, or more and, and much more frequent international communication about uh, nuclear weapons in Europe. Uh, I think this has been done before, but um, I also would like to lift this on a, a, a next level. Uh, and I think this website uh, could be of use for this. Um, 
we have started to collect information uh, right now, mainly in English, but we also um, should see how to include other languages um, or uh, try to um, translate other languages into English so that we can make available information um, for everybody that understands English. I think this is uh, the common language uh, that we are having. Um, we do not have uh, a lot of social media work right now. We are doing some. We decided not to have, as of now, own communication channels um, because we wouldn't know how to, to feed them with communication. Uh, so IPB is uh, uh, doing this uh, as of now. Um, but I think this uh, could also improve. Um, we, we don't have, as of now, own materials. Um, we have a logo uh, on the website, but uh, we do not have a newsletter. We, we send out a press release. Uh, I think this is something where we should also think how to improve this and make available materials for local groups in different countries to, to spread information and to maybe even go to the street and, and ask people to sign the appeal. Um, we also, uh, in, in this matter, we don't have a, a, um, a really big day-to-day -day working base. Um, so we do not have uh, somebody who takes care of this campaign uh, on, on a day-to-day -day basis. I think everybody who is involved uh, with this is volunteering and we have the IPB office who are doing a lot of work, but they also have other things on their plate. Um, and uh, the, the last point where we where you can see what, that we just started this uh, campaign, we do not have any budget as of now. At least I'm not aware of any budget. And I think this also makes it a little difficult um, to, to provide website services, to improve the website, to improve social media, to generate or to produce materials and so on. So uh, maybe this is also something we need to think about, but uh, we have uh, the, the first stone of this new campaign uh, laid out. We have an appeal, uh, you can sign it on the website and we can use the website and improve it uh, over the next couple of months for our common activities. Thanks. Well, thank you so much for these contributions to our discussion. And when you agree, I would jump to Session two, action opportunities. Give the chair to my colleague Eskil and the first speaker, I think, will be Dave. Dave, the floor is to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I think this has been a very useful discussion so far and I hope we can carry on in, in the same vein. Um, I think we're, we're to talk about what kind of actions we might be able to support in our different campaigns. And uh, here in Britain, we have this problem of COVID still. I think it, in Germany, it's much easier. In other countries, uh, I'm not quite clear how well it's going, but we're, we're, we're suffering from a second um, peak in the COVID experience here in the UK. And cities are being locked down one by one, maybe the whole country will be fairly soon once again, uh, mainly to do with the total incompetence of the government, but it's incompetent in many other ways as well. So, but the COVID experience has been kind of interesting, um, apart from being disastrous. Uh, it has made campaigning very difficult um, in terms of what we would normally be doing, holding meetings, protesting at various bases, etc. Uh, in other ways, it's made things a bit easier because it's easier to, to actually form a meeting now. It's easier to meet up with colleagues from around the world than, than it was previously. So uh, there are some advantages to what we've learned through how we can communicate and work together through, through the internet, through Zoom or whatever. Uh, it's really difficult to say. I know that the major, one of the major things that we're working towards in this campaign is some actions in April around the different bases that exist. And, and obviously, I think it's important that we include the bases of the nuclear weapons that aren't necessarily the United States. Um, uh, so that includes the UK and France. And uh, in the UK, although really we do have US nuclear weapons, they're called UK nuclear weapons. 
uh, and they're based in Scotland. Uh, I don't think there's anybody from Scotland or from Scottish CND here on this particular at this particular meeting and I have been in contact with them and asked whether they would be able to attend uh, but they're having some some problems themselves with uh, staff uh, and, and so on so uh, we're hoping that we would be able to do something around Faz Lane the um, a submarine base uh, where the nuclear weapons are held up in Scotland in April, we, we will certainly be working with the Scottish CND and others to, to try and do some, make some kind of presence. I don't think it'll be a huge demonstration. There won't be thousands of people, but maybe a small group of people, at least a presence will, will be there and we'll, we'll, we'll do other things. I mean, what we're, our campaigning is focusing on at the moment uh, is really to try to uh, encourage people to sign up to the ICANN pledge in terms of parliamentarians, but also extending that out uh, to uh, local politicians, so local councillors, city councillors, because city campaign is also extremely important, I think, that we get more of our local politicians involved in, in these kind of discussions. Uh, but also faith leaders, which is something that um, has really not been focused on so much. So we're looking at trying to get uh, many of those involved, not just the Christian faith, but other faiths too. We have a, a whole load of faiths uh, in this country as uh, obviously there are throughout Europe. So that's one of the things we're focusing on. It's, it's easier to do that over the, over the internet. We can write to our MPs, we can encourage people, others to write to their MPs, to their local councillors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and in Britain now, we're, we're gradually increasing the number of MPs that are signed up to the ICANN pledge. And we're also increasing the number of cities that are getting actively involved in putting forward statements of support. So I think it's quite a useful way to work up from the, from the bottom in this way. Um, um, what else can I say? Uh, we're hoping um, that we'd be able to extend uh, the the um, the campaign wider. I think Russian nuclear weapons are important, but I also agree with those who say, let's try to achieve what is most likely to be achievable. Uh, and it seems to me that I just read this uh, article about the three German MEPs who entered the Buchel base. Uh, I mean, that sounds very positive and that's encouraging a, de a debate to happen, I think in Germany more so. We need those kind of actions. Just a small group of people can make a big impact if we choose the right thing to do and the right people to get involved. So um, there's a bit of time before April. We want to try and encourage the discussion about a nuclear free Europe is extremely important. I think it is achievable. I think we can do it, uh, but we've got to all work together and we all have to make sure that we understand each other, we understand each other's reservations, the problems that they're folk, uh, uh, faced with, uh, and overcome them together. And I think this in also includes reaching out to the Russian people more. I think we need some kind of more of a people to people kind of um, campaign, like we had once back in the 70s or 80s, when people were trying to connect uh, with, uh, with groups in um it, it's difficult i know it's very difficult but um we did have a plan at one time i think reiner of having a train journey through russia and stopping at different places and, and meeting people and talking etc i think this is very important um, a couple of a year or so ago i went with a global network uh, campaign global network against weapons and nuclear power in space and we we went to Russia, we had a meeting in Moscow, we, we also went to the Crimea and we talked to people there. And it's amazing the kind of insights you get just from talking to people in their own countries on their home ground about their feelings and about what they think are important uh, issues and how we can work together to, to build a, a, a better world. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think that's probably um, enough from me. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, our next speaker is now Angelica Clausen from the IPPNW. Angelica. 
Uh, can you hear me? Okay, I sent around a presentation uh, for everybody and can we use that pre presentation so that now everybody can look on it? I sent it uh, to you and I all and I uh, sent a corrected version to, to Lukas and Rainer again. So please take this corrected version. It's a little bit more. Uh, the, I'll put it in the chat now, so it should be available for everyone. Uh, everybody could, could look in the chat. So, uh, in my presentation, I started with the current European situation. As we uh, said before, there are three nuclear weapon states, France, Russia, and UK. There are five umbrella states, Belgium, Germany, uh, Italy, Netherlands, and Turkey. And we have a lot of um, a lot of NATO, European NATO states. So it's Belgium, Denmark, France, Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, United Kingdom, Greece, Turkey, Germany, Spain, Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland. And then uh, another uh, very important fact uh, we are facing with is uh, that the worldwide uh, nuclear arms race uh, is uh, at a very high uh, level and there is a ro an erosion of the disarmament uh, treaties. And then uh, the next I put uh, uh, what we have achieved as um, the peace movement, in the peace movement in the last years. Uh, for a long time, and we have to make this clear to ourselves, uh, we uh, we know that, uh, and it's proven that there is an overall people's opposition against nuclear weapons. We have this opposition, and uh, there are numerous um, studies were done that it's like 80 or 90 percent, or even more of the people are against nuclear weapons. They don't want them, but on the same time, there's little activism in these people that don't want uh, nuclear weapons. And this little activism is uh, being um, so uh, since years. And there's a, a weak peace movement in East and West. Uh, uh, and the movement against uh, military bases, uh, nuclear weapons military bases in Europe, uh, is also very weak. Uh, there are people, they are doing continuous work. Uh, and for instance, uh, we uh, talking about Germany, we have uh, since I think uh, 10 years, uh, a very good um, movement uh, to make activities on uh, Büchel again, the nuclear weapon space in, uh, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, we have also activities in Belgium and the Netherlands and also on the uh, two uh, 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 basis in Italy, but uh, uh, in Turkey, uh, since uh, the Osorian um, uh, government of Erdogan uh, is so so bad, and it, it, it's really I, I have to say it open. Uh, it for me, it's nearly to hit the fascism. Uh, what he is doing, and uh, in nineteen uh, in 20, uh, 18 we had. Uh, no, in 2016, we had a, a meeting in, Bel in Belgrade uh, and we had their representative from ICANN, but uh, further on uh, from Turkey. And we, we couldn't have that anymore. Uh, it's, uh, the repression is just too, too much in Turkey. So one has to uh, ma make this open. Uh, that's um, why um, further on, I will not talk about uh, Turkey, but uh, talk about uh, the other four European countries uh, as nuclear umbrella states. Then what we also have is that I can win the Peace Nobel Prize. We are very clear, uh, close uh, to the 50th uh, ratification. It's expected to be in October this year. And then uh, the uh, nuclear ban treaty will get into force. And we, this is very, very important for us because we can use this time and say there is a new, um, there is a new thing. There is a nuclear ban treaty. It's, uh, it shows that the people that are against nuclear weapons are right. 
and um, we should really use the time this coming uh, year. And then we have a growing and very strong climate change movement in many, many European countries. But the same people, there were millions on the street last year uh, in the climate movement. It was on the 25th of uh, September, I uh, remember. Uh, and uh, there are these people that are on the street, they have little knowledge and therefore not so much interest in peace and nuclear issues. It's not that they don't have, might, they, they might not have interest, but uh, climate is more important for them. But we can talk to all these people and we can gain uh, them because they are young people and they're good people and wonderful people. So I think this for us is a chance to build up an overarching uh, perspective in the climate security nexus. So we have to put this, uh, think this together uh, that in times of COVID-19 and climate change, uh, there is no space at all for nuclear weapons, no space for nuclear arms race and so on. And we really have to uh, solve uh, our big, big problems uh, on climate, uh, climate change and climate crisis and also uh, on this very, very rotten state of the social, um, social care so, uh, in these times. So, uh, my uh, pledge is our perspective should be we should rethink security in times of climate crisis and COVID-19. This is a real chance for us. And my pledge is to reframe security thinking. Security is not nothing for governments, uh, uh, but in the first uh, place, we the people, uh, the human, uh, humanitarian security is important. And I can, as a campaign, did this. Um, they they try to put uh, put it all around. Uh, in the first place, our human security is important, and not uh, the military or so-called government security. So, let us think security from a humanitarian perspective and put new priorities. No place and no money for nuclear weapons and military. Uh, this is what uh, peace institutions and peace uh, groups have done so, uh, before anyway, so it's nothing real new. But when we open it uh, with uh, climate questions, then I think we can uh, gain new people. And as I remember from British, um, from British friends, uh, from MEDEC, they told me, uh, that in Britain, uh, uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, which started as uh, only climate activism, they said, uh, they also say now that uh, they are uh, working for peace and for the new security. Uh, so I think this is a chance. Peace building and humanitarian responses, uh, socio-economic development need to become climate sensitive. This is my pledge. And, uh, okay. Uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, some actions and some campaigns. Uh, it's not complete. There are many, many, many other campaigns and uh, we should, um, I, I think we should uh, make a good list and a good presentation of how many campaigns are there. And I uh, agree uh, what uh, Ludo said um, in his statement before. Uh, he said it's now the time uh, to, for the four, and I, I'm speaking of four nuclear and better states now, not Turkey, because it's, uh, we don't have any chance to do the anything now uh, under, under Erdogan. So let's uh, concentrate on the four uh, nuclear sharing say, umbrella states and say and nuclear sharing. And we are able uh, to, uh, to do something like a common campaign. Um, and uh, I was um, I was uh, doing advertisement for that in the I Can Europe call, and uh, others um, were happy about that. And it it can start, I think. We, for instance, we can make uh, common op-eds uh, on the parliamentarian uh, level. 
that uh, that parliamentarians from these four states together say we want to end nuclear sharing in our countries. So Germany and uh, Rolf Mützenich is not alone. Uh, always the conservative uh, German politicians say, oh, we're so low, we can't do anything about refugees, we can't do anything about any the nuclear sharing and changes at all. So we have to say, we want to do it together. Here are the parliamentarians that say it and that work together. And we should try uh, to get such op-eds in main um, in uh, main newspapers and maybe uh, also on television that uh, these parliamentarians do that together. We want to end nuclear sharing. Uh, we want to use the coming year when the, uh, when the nuclear ban uh, entries into force. And the second thing I want to pledge for is that we can do uh, common bike tours, for instance, from one nuclear base uh, from uh, Kleine Brogel to Büchel, or from uh, from Kleine Brogel to Völkel in 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 um, in the Netherlands. Uh, when uh, I was in Büchel uh, this year in uh, in August, there were hundred uh, people uh, on a three uh, three days action camp, and uh, fifty of them were young people. And uh, we made uh, many, many different actions there. And also some uh, representative from uh, Pax uh, Netherlands came. And there a, a young uh, person, Remco, and they decided uh, with the German student group from ITP and W to make a common bike tour to Völkel. And uh, this is a way we can, uh, we can start uh, to find new young people to do some action that in the way they like it. And uh, I think uh, we should also do common things for Italy. We have to, uh, we have to uh, support uh, all the Italian activities. And uh, from Germany to Italy, it's very long, but we can maybe uh, use some place in, in Austria uh, or in, um, in, in Switzerland uh, uh, to go there and to go to Italy to go to the uh, to the bases or do it with a train or, wh or whatsoever. So we should really uh, try to make common activities in a way that uh, is possible for us. The same, um, I think uh, we could think about uh, doing actions to support the pro protests in Parslane in a European country. Um, okay, I said in Turkey, I don't see any possibility for NGO work now. Um, this has to be done in another way. Uh, and I don't know uh, if uh, uh, Tanuk uh, Bay uh, maybe has some proposals for that because he is from Turkey. Then uh, I want to talk about a campaign in, in Germany. Uh, it's called Atombomba Nein Danke, uh, Climate and Social. Uh, so, uh, yes, please. Uh, Atombomba Nein Danke means no to nuclear fighters. Uh, and yes, let us work for climate and social ecological transformation. And uh, we have uh, made uh, a new transparent from IPPNW on that. I'll show it to you. And then we need to address uh, and organize youth events, which uh, come together uh, on um, nuclear and climate. And then uh, I show to you this nice transparent uh, nuclear bombers, no thanks. And uh, uh, yes to climate and social campaigning. And we will use uh, this new transparent uh, in the climate marches that are uh, done uh, all over uh, Europe, I think, on the 25th of uh, September. Um, then uh, we need to uh, think extra at special things, what we can do, uh, like common actions in nuclear arms states. And I think it is, uh, it is necessary to make more uh, and regular video conferences that, which really uh, put uh, this uh, problem in the focus, especially how can 
the uh, nuclear weapon states, France and Italy uh, and uh, UK work in a new way together. Uh, I don't know uh, what kind, uh, how many um, anti-nuclear weapons uh, groups are in France and, and where they are and how we could support them. Maybe Alain uh, will say us about something about this in the afternoon when he comes back again. Then uh, I also uh, have the idea, and this idea is from our uh, friend Peter Buys from uh, IPPNW Netherlands. Uh, he will be uh, he will be in a conference uh, in Saint Petersburg next week, um, and uh, will speak there on uh, nuclear weapons disarmament. And he has made links with. Uh, uh, politicians in, uh, in Russia uh, to, to work on nuclear disarmament uh, over, the, um, over the boundaries. And I think that we should uh, especially ask peace uh, institute, like the, the Hamburg uh, Peace Institute in, in Germany, or there are other peace, good peace institutes in, in uh, Great Britain, or France, or Belgium, or Netherlands, or so or in Sweden or Switzerland, that uh, they could help us to organize uh, smaller conferences or video conferences where we try to find new ideas to make uh, nuclear weapon states countries want uh, a step by step smaller disarmament. Maybe we can, um, we can start to do such work with them. And then I think we need uh, the, and this has been started uh, before uh, last year, I think, expert uh, studies on the carbon footprint on, uh, on military and nuclear weapons. And um, I think there are some UK studies, good UK studies and also uh, American studies. So we could think how we can use these studies or um, focus on some aspects better uh, to um, to tell the climate activists how much uh, carbon footprint the military uh, does. And I think that, um, as I know from our colleagues, uh, IPPNW colleagues in Switzerland and uh, in, in Sweden, they have done a lot of great work to work with the parliamentarians there. And uh, they came so far that the parliament in Sweden and Switzerland, or want um, uh, want uh, to um, to join the Ban Treaty, but uh, and the Parliament voted for that there, but the government and the Foreign Ministry said, um, "Oh, we cannot do it now. We have to think about it," and it was postponed, postponed, postponed. So uh, we should also join with uh, these wonderful people. Uh, they are a, lo a lot of time come from ICANN and from IPPNW, and they have a lot of potential. Maybe they also could host such uh, conferences. And then the next thing, um, in the end, uh, to come to the end, I think we uh, need cross-sector anti-nuclear weapons and anti-nuclear energy campaigns European-wide. We have uh, in the climate um, and anti-nuclear energy movement, weapons are often forgotten and vice, vice versa. But in all nuclear weapon states, the military utilizes the civilian nuclear industry through hidden subsidies regarding the human resources, research funds, investment in dual use nuclear infrastructures. And there is really no robust civil nuclear industry and the associated nuclear infrastructures and nuclear weapons program could not be sustainable due to the very high cost and their need for trade personnel. And for that, in the end, I uh, put this Hinkley point um, uh, uh, Hinkley Point C, uh, it's, um, there's a study done by um, uh, experts, uh, UK experts, who show that there are so many hidden subventions for re um, 
in the Hinkley Point uh, in the Hinkley Point project, which is overcosted and overcosted, uh, and it is really for renewing the British nuclear armed submarine. So that's the real reason why Hinkley Point uh, is uh, is built, and it's very bad that we still have the Euratom Treaty. Uh, where um, the, the purpose of the Euratom Treaty is to uh, is to support nuclear industry and nuclear uh, nuclear energy, a new nuclear power plant, and uh, this is also some point where a common work uh, has to be done. So these are my points. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, as we we're saying, it's now time to move over to the overview of the. TPNW campaign, uh, which we'll, we will hear from uh, Daniel Högsta from ICAM. Uh, Daniel, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to speak to you. And I see a lot of, lot of friends um, here among us. So uh, I hope, hope this is not all just totally familiar information for everyone. But yeah, I've been asked to speak a little bit about the, the TPNW, um, you know, the overview of the campaigning we're working work we're doing right now and where things uh, stand at the moment. Uh, so as I'm sure many of you uh, know, um, we're at 44 ratifications, so we're six away from uh, that important number of 50, which is of course the number at which the, the treaty uh, enters into force. Um, we are expecting, uh, we're quite confident that we're going to reach 50 uh, before the end of this year, possibly within the next month or so. Uh, that's something we're pushing for quite, quite hard. Obviously, um, the situation with the UN and all the meetings being rescheduled and, and moved around and, and just the nature of uh, having, just the, just the technical nature of having to, you know, book a time with the Office for Legal Affairs to deposit an instrument of ratification. It's hard to really know uh, exactly when, when these things uh, will come in. But we are working with some of the uh, champion uh, TPNW states that you would be very familiar with, the Austrias, Mexico's, uh, South Africa, uh, Nigeria, Ireland, uh, to identify uh, an appropriate time at which we can have a kind of celebration. And obviously, it's going to be a bit of a weird celebration, as everything this year has been, um, but at least having a moment to uh, commemorate the, the 50th deposit. So as uh, the legal scholars uh, among you will know that uh, the 50th, uh, the deposit of the 50th ratification is one thing uh, under the treaty, under Article 8 of the treaty, 90 days later is when the treaty officially uh, enters into force and becomes uh, international, binding international law and its uh, states parties. Um, so for us, um, just, just to put a campaigning uh, uh, eye on that, since it's so difficult to know the exact date of when the 50th uh, deposit will take place, um, uh, we've kind of thought that that's going to be more of a, of a media moment. Whereas, because we've got that 90-day period between, we'll be able to look at that and see and plan uh, for, that, for that date of entry into force. And so that will be more of the campaigning moment. And, you know, it, it, it might seem a bit strange to, to de decouple the time we want to get media and the time we want to do campaigning, but, uh, but obviously it's unlikely, given the way that the media focuses on nuclear weapons in general and the TPNW in particular, it's quite hard. It's, you know, we, we can't imagine that they will give as much coverage, coverage to it uh, at both times. So just on the media aspect, you know, there are certain things, uh, I think many of you probably share my uh, irritation, frustration at some at the, at the way the media presents the TPNW sometimes, and, and even sometimes just you know factual uh, inaccuracies uh, related to it. So there's still work we can do, and that's what you know we've uh, spoken with uh, ICANN uh, campaigners and ICANN partner organizations to do is to brief the media in their countries on the, the specifics uh, related to the TPNW and what entry into force uh, actually means from a legal perspective, uh, but also from a, a normative uh, perspective since that's crucial. Um, so for those of you who are interested in that, and I'm obviously, you know, those of you who are already part of ICANN and know that you, you will already have received that information, but also if there's any others who are keen to receive some more information about the, the legal and normative implications of the, the TPNW entry into force, please do let me know and I can send you a briefing paper that we've uh, just uh, finished uh, working on that will kind of help guide some of those questions. Um, but like I said, so that's the, that's the, 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 the date of the 50th uh, ratification. 90 days later, obviously, is when we want to make uh, as much noise as possible uh, around the treaty, uh, you know, taking life. And I think, uh, you know, I just want to pause for a moment and say many of you in this group I know have been working on 
on the TPNW or within ICANN for, for many years. And, and you know, many, many more of you have been working on nuclear disarmament for, for many, many, many years before that. And I think we shouldn't, uh, you know, it's hard to overstate uh, how significant this moment is. I mean, this is the first treaty that comprehensively prohibits uh, nuclear weapons uh, in all, all the activities related to it. I mean, there's not going to be another treaty that comes up and, and does this again. Uh, this, is, this is a hugely significant uh, moment. This is, we're creating a new normal uh, as it concerns nuclear weapons. And, and I think it's going to be a major boost to lots of the activities that, that I've heard um, many of you spoke, speaking about um, you know, before I spoke and also with the Nuclear Weapons for Europe uh, campaign in general. So we should really uh, make, the, make the most of that. And we can already, we can already uh, anticipate uh, the statement that's going to come from, from the P5 or the P3 or whatever, whoever decides to make a statement about it. You know, we're going to hear things like, uh, you know, as the P3 have said many times, the UK, uh, France and the United States, we will never sign this treaty. You know, this treaty will, will not have any impact upon us, which is a beautiful example of the uh, persistent objector rule for those of you who are uh, international legal uh, nerds. Um, but they also say things like um, this treaty will never have any effect, but at the same time it's destabilizing. So that, that, that uh, balance between it's on the one hand extremely dangerous, on the other hand uh, insignificant. So they, they managed to square that circle uh, somehow. So we can already imagine the list of arguments uh, that are going to come up against them. And it, you know, it's incumbent upon us to work to, to counter those as much as possible, um, but not, to, not from a defensive standpoint. I mean, we should be uh, assertive and confident in talking about what this means. And we can do that because we know the impact that treaties like this on other weapons have had. You know, nuclear weapons obviously you know, are given a special status among many countries, but from looking at a normative uh, impact, we've seen other treaties uh, extremely successful in changing the narrative around nuclear how nuclear weapons are um, discussed. So I'm fortunate that, um, that you know, have coming after Angelica and, and Dave as well, because they touched on some of the things that I, some of the projects that ICANN is working on. Um, but if I can just go through some of them uh, right now, perhaps that would be useful for those of you who aren't as familiar. So first, and Dave spoke um, about the ICANN Cities Appeal. Um, and, and I want to acknowledge that CND has done an amazing job, uh, not only the City Appeal, but also the Parliamentary Pledge um, to get uh, signatories on board. The Cities Appeal, excuse me, is a, um, it's what it sounds like. It's an appeal made from cities, but not only cities, but also um, uh, towns. Um, there's, you know, we, we kind of don't differ, we don't differentiate or, you know, distinguish between them. I mean, cities and towns are equally uh, valid. Uh, as Dave noted, it's the, the, lo the pressure from the local, which is uh, most important. But it's a commitment that, mm -hmm. uh, that works, that encourages these uh, entities to, um, you know, pressure their government or undertake other activities related to it. For example, many of you might have noticed the, or might have seen the uh, process that's taking place in New York City. And so New York City is obviously, you know, demographic, you know, huge demographic mass, but in addition, it's also a, a city that has, uh, through its investment for, for its pension portfolios, has investments in, in nuclear weapons. And so part of joining the city's appeal for New York will be to ensure that there's no uh, investments that go into companies uh, that produce uh, nuclear weapons. So that's something that all, a lot of cities uh, and towns uh, can do as well, in addition to the city's appeal, in addition to signing the city's appeal. The second initiative is the ICANN uh, Parliamentary Pledge. Um, Sorry, just on the cities appeal, we have 400, almost 400 uh, cities and towns on there. And one thing we're going to be encouraging them all to do, and for those of you who are working on this appeal, we'd also encourage you to, to help out with this, is to, you know, in, at a very basic level, they should all be commemorating um, the entry into force of the treaty when it happens. Uh, that's a very basic step that they can take, uh, sending out a statement uh, or doing social media around that. I mean, I think that's something that, you know, even if it's a small town or a big big city like Paris, uh, we really want to, to encourage that. So secondly, the ICANN Parliamentarian Pledge, and this is something that has been um, very useful um, over the last few years. It's an initiative we've run since the treaty was adopted in 2017. Uh, it's a commitment by uh, members of uh, parliaments in the United States. It's called the Legislator's Pledge because they don't use the word parliamentarian. Uh, as much, um, but it's a commitment to uh, raise the issue of the TPNW within the national legislature uh, as much as possible. So we've seen everything from uh, parliamentary questions uh, being asked to 
um, reports and uh, you know investigations commissioned um, on the implications of a certain country, Norway, for example, on joining the TPNW, uh, and that's something that uh, you know it's mandated by the parliament. The government has to set up a, a commission to. Uh, to get both sides of the debate and is something that keeps the issue of the TPNW uh, alive and discussed and, and more public, especially in countries that are uh, whose governments uh, are against uh, the treaty at, at this point. So, you know, many of your NATO, NATO countries, umbrella countries uh, in general. Um, so, I know I should also mention that we've also seen uh, parliamentarians actually raise motions um, to, you know, commit the government to, to sign uh, the treaty altogether. So uh, Angelica right, very well touched upon or encapsulated the situation in, in Switzerland. Uh, and that is uh, precisely that. It's a, it's a, the, what happened there was a motion from uh, an individual parliamentarian. Obviously, he, you know, we did a lot of campaigning around that and got the support of the majority of, of parliament. But basically, the motion went through all different, Switzerland is a bicameral system. It went through the foreign affairs committees of both chambers and then through the main hall and then collectively all together. And uh, they voted to reject the government's decision um, to not sign the TPNW for the meantime. And that's put the government in, as, Ange as Angelica noted, in a very difficult uh, position uh, of having to justify why they are, why they are not uh, joining the TPNW. And that's something that we know from a political standpoint makes politicians very uncomfortable, you know, because they they're forced to, the question becomes very simple, and they're forced to kind of waffle a little bit, which doesn't look good. Um, and I'm, I'm not gonna go into the, the details of where that initiative is gonna go next in Switzerland, but it's far from uh, decided. Um, there's other initiatives that are, that are uh, underway at the moment to kind of force the government's hand on that. So we're, we're feeling quite hopeful uh, there, uh, at least. So the parliamentarian pledge, a very useful thing, and as, as Dave noted, it's not something that only national parliamentarians can, can join, it's also something that local uh, council people can join as well. And lastly, uh, I want to note on, I'm gonna make a note on the uh, divestment uh, work. Um, we have, uh, you know, many of you are of course familiar with the Don't Bank on the Bomb report, which is produced by, by Pax and ICANN. Uh, which you know highlights the, the the financial institutions that are invested in companies uh, that invest in companies that produce uh, nuclear weapons. Um, and what's interesting, uh, if you look at if you look at how financial institutions, most financial institutions, even even the biggest ones, determine um, what is an appropriate investment or not as it concerns weapons, is um, this notion or this uh, term which exists in, in, the, in the financial sphere of controversial weapons. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that term already. And there's no set definition of it, but most definitions that you know, uh, industry observers or uh, the financial institutions themselves uh, have um, is, is, is there a treaty under international law which prohibits uh, this weapon? And you know, uh, previous uh, until the TPNW enters into force, the, there is only one instrument that is that is recognized or that is discussed in many of these definitions, which is the NPT. And you know, for most financial institutions, I mean, we can debate that all we want, but for financial institutions, they don't they don't perceive that as a uh, as a ban on nuclear weapons. So they don't perceive it as something that should limit companies from from working from investing in it or or building the weapons. But now with the with the TPNW. Um, we should be encouraging them, and I think many of them will revise their revise their definitions, revise their uh, portfolios to to mention the TPNW, and that will change the way that that, uh, that it's perceived from a from an investment uh, perspective. So that's something we're very um, excited about. Uh, we've seen this is something that we've seen very clear implications uh, for in other countries, uh, especially with the cluster munitions. So even in countries, I should say, that don't sign the TPNW, the financial institutions in those countries still recognize. Uh, the relevance uh, and the normative weight of an international uh, legal instrument that prohibits a certain activity, in this case, uh, building of, a, of nuclear weapons. So that's another thing that is, uh, you know, in the medium term is something that we're going to push uh, quite hard. And if any of you are interested in that, please do uh, let me know. Uh, and finally, before I wrap, before I, before I close, and I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion, is um, just a quick update on, on Monday, um, we are publishing a letter. This is an initiative from an ICANN partner organization in Australia. And they've gathered uh, signatures onto a letter, signatures from uh, ex-ministers, so former ministers of uh, defense, 
uh, foreign affairs or prime ministers um, onto a letter which is clearly in support of uh, the TPNW and makes the case for why umbrella states should reject nuclear weapons. So this is a letter that's reserved ex exclusively for non-nuclear weapon states uh, of the nuclear umbrella. So NATO, other countries like that, not countries that actually possess nuclear weapons. Um, so that letter is going to be published on Monday. We have uh, signatories like Ban Ki-moon on there, which we're very excited about, Guy Verhofstadt. Um, we've got two former NATO secretary generals, including Sol Javier Solana from Spain and Willy Klaas from, from Belgium. So we're expecting that to be, uh, you know, make some, make some waves. We've given the exclusive rights to that to, to Project Syndicate, who, will be, who are, of course have members across the world and will be publishing at that. So I encourage you to keep your eyes out for that. And if you're interested in the text of the letter or uh, doing more work around it, please also let me know about that. So uh, thank you. I hope I haven't gotten too far over time, but uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the TPNW with all of you. And uh, yeah, looking forward to the discussion. And I will give the floor to Ludo. Ludo, you are the first speaker. The floor is to you. Hello, you, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think um, uh, I would like to talk about uh, concrete ideas uh, for um, uh, a common campaign um, on the nuclear arms in Europe. So maybe just to start with, uh, let's not forget uh, in August last year, the INF Treaty um, ceased to exist. So the treaty uh, from 1987 uh, ensured the elimination of uh, 2,700 of the most uh, destabilizing uh, nuclear weapons and helped to put an end uh, to the nuclear arms race between the US and the then Soviet Union. And so it was maybe millions of people that time in Europe protested in the 80s against displacement of, of the placement of these weapons of mass destruction in our country. So I think without this political pressure from the peace movement, there might not have been an INF deal. So now, Nothing, unfortunately, by seizing, uh, by, because the INF uh, treaty ceased to exist, uh, nothing can hold back the US and Russia from reproducing nuclear weapons with a range between 500 and 5,500 kilometers. So last year, for example, only days after the abolition of the INF treaty, the US tested for the first time a cruise, aisle, a cruise missile that previously was banned by the treaty. So while the nuclear arms control regime is falling apart, the American tactical B-61 nuclear bombs in Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and Turkey will be replaced by a modern uh, B-61-12 version, or an upgrade B-61-12 version. Um, and on top, up, on top of that, France and the UK are heavily investing in their nuclear arsenals as well. So only not many, um, unfortunately, seem to care anymore. Uh, currently, we are not witnessing political crisis uh, as we had the time in the 80s in Belgium, for example, on nuclear arms, and highly mediatized uh, discussions of nuclear arms, as we have seen in the 80s as well. So there is currently no broad and strong coalition of civil society movements able to create the needed mass movement for agenda setting and political pressure. So this is a situation we are in uh, now, I think, if we are honest. I think uh, we all agree uh, that we need a strategy to build a stronger anti-nuclear weapons movement. And part of this strategy could be aimed at convincing other movements, environmental, trade unions, youth, women movements, and so forth, of the importance and common interests of the abolition of nuclear arms. So in my view, to be able to get there, a first step is to increase the visib our visibility with a common European ca campaign against the modernization of nuclear arsenals, and more in particular, the replacement of the about 150 US bombs in the five host countries. And this summer, um, we, this appeal was launched for nuclear weapons-free uh, Europe with three demands. We discussed it already. Uh, only up to now, I checked it, only 460 people signed it. As was mentioned by Reiner already, that's far too low. And that's far below what we potentially can collect, I'm sure of it. And so a question is, how can we succeed? It's a very important question. If we want to launch a campaign, really, how can we succeed in having 
the appeal known and signed by many thousands. In this digital world, we have the tools. Um, or should we try to have well-known petition platforms like Avas, there are other well, uh, as well, to distribu distribute or to help to distribute? Come on. Um, can we, sorry, can we encourage local organizations, for example, uh, as another mean, in each of the countries to promote the campaign? Did we, we, we didn't do that really, I think, or we do not have a strategy uh, for that up to now. Uh, I also think the appeal should be accompanied um, with the launch of a common day or days of action with a fixed date and as soon as possible a clear scenario. This could be, for example, in April next year. Maybe that's too fast. Uh, this is something to discuss, to be discussed. Um, this can be translated in all kinds of actions, like a classical demonstration at a nuclear basis in each of the countries, a cycle tour, as Angelica mentioned, human chain uh, and so forth. Uh, for my country, the Netherlands and Germany, Angelica mentioned that also, we could take, adv take advantage of the proximity of the nuclear bases, for example, with a, uh, a bicycle tour, uh, with a three or two day bicycle tour. I count it's 280 kilometers from Buchel to Plane Brogel to Volkel. Um, or we can build on the experiences of actions like in Buchel by setting up a peace camp organizing civil disobedience actions, uh, discussions. Um, a day of action can also be translated in decentralized actions in many uh, European cities like vigils, demonstrations, etc. In Belgium, for example, we have a yearly uh, peace flag campaign on the International Peace Day, which is now on Monday, next Monday, uh, by asking cities and municipalities to hang out the peace flag. And we always connect it to a political demand, uh, and this year by focusing on the uh, TPNW and the issue of the US nuclear, US nuclear bombs in the military base of Tenebrogo. And so I'm happy to say that one quarter of all Belgian cities and municipalities, which is 150 cities and municipalities, support the campaign by hanging the peace flag, often accompanied by uh, distributing our political message on their websites or by organizing local events events or activities. And there are 50 mayors among these, uh, from these cities and municipalities that signed the letter that will be sent to the government uh, Monday um, asking for a transparent and open debate on nuclear sharing, emphasizing the, the need also to sign the TPNW. Maybe such a peace flag campaign can be organized on a European level next year, on the 21st, promoting on the International Day of Peace, uh, promoting a nuclear weapon free Europe. Um, if, for example, I can, could promote or even take the lead of such a campaign, that could ha have a wide uh, response. We should not limit ourselves to physical actions, I think, uh, especially in times of Corona, the importance of digital actions via social media and other tools has increased. Anyhow, a combination, I think this could be the strength of all kinds of action, can be mutually reinforcing. Um, whatever the actions look like, another important issue is, to, is how to have as many as possible participants. And to succeed, I think it's cru crucial that we build an active coalition of all kinds of movements. In the coming weeks and first months, uh, we should discuss with them how to promote the campaign and their involvement. Uh, I think uh, trade unions, are very important. We have seen it in the 80s, as, uh, at least in Belgium, I think in other countries as well, how they uh, have, um, yeah, let's say the, the, the strength and the, the, the really the, the potential uh, to create a huge movement. Um, yeah. Also political environmental youth uh, movements, uh, among others, are important. Uh, we need to have ICANN on board as well, organizations like Greenpeace. Local, local groups are also important. Each of us has at least its local, sectoral, or international networks. And in those few months, uh, we may not be able to create a mass movement worth the name, but I do think we can increase our visibility in media and the political world. If we succeed in doing this, we'll have better conditions, uh, I think, to mobilize. Another crucial dimension is uh, a coordinated international common initiative by uh, a progressive uh, member of parliament against the modernization or upgrade of nuclear bombs 
uh, are the um, the investments in nuclear arsenals in Europe in general. And they can support the appeal, commit themselves by tabling resolutions, parliamentary questions, or by publishing open ads. It's only we need to make this kind of actions uh, or to organize this on a European level, well discussed in a, with, a, with a well strategy, I think. Uh, local councils can be asked to sign a declaration opposing nuclear sharing and replacement of uh, nuclear arms. So to conclude, um, I think in our discussion now, we should answer questions like, what are the main targets of our campaign? Uh, I think we define them already in general, but maybe it should be more uh, uh, defined in detail. Uh, what kind of campaign we will need to reach these targets? What be, will be our calendar in the coming months and even years? Uh, I think we have, at least for uh, com uh, the, the US bombs in the sh uh, sh nation uh, sharing these bombs, um, we have uh, up to 2024 uh, to, uh, to campaign on that. How do we organize? Uh, do we need a working group uh, to prepare that in the coming weeks? Uh, we have to start uh, as soon as possible, I think. Um, also, how to construct a strong, diverse platform of organizations from the civil society? How to increase our visibility? How to reach and mobilize citizens and politicians? These are, among others, I think important questions we have to face and we have to answer now or in the coming uh, weeks. So whatever we conclude uh, today, um, the planned upgrades of uh, nuclear bombs and nuclear arsenals investments are important opportunities today for a successful com common European campaign that if well planned and coordinated can have a more widespread uh, response and also hopefully impact. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, great. Now, that, that, that's sorry. I, I might have some problems with my connection, so I hope it will work. Uh, I am Marielle Denis, and uh, I welcome everybody. I don't know if you were all there. Uh, before, but that's really nice to, to see you all back again and to welcome the new people. So this afternoon we will have, we, like you just said, Ludo, we will focus on uh, where we go, what do we want to achieve and, um, and can we frame, uh, can this group uh, be, um, and, and this discussion be um, a next level for what started one year ago in um, in Brussels. Uh, so from what was said this morning, there was a lot of very interesting uh, ideas that was thrown. And to me, it's really striking me that um, there is a need for much more common discussion and exchange at the European level, because this space is one of the most um, nuclearized with the four uh, nuclear weapon uh, states involved and um, the tensions are rising. So I wanted to point um, just with a few sentences uh, the important be benchmarks that are just coming. You spoke about a calendar, Ludo, so that's I'm going to try to, um, uh, to point that. And, um, and first, I would like to speak about the situation where we are all uh, in, in, at different uh, level, but uh, at least in Spain, France, Belgium, uh, the impact of the uh, pandemic is, is, still, um, is still there and it's uh, rising again. And um, this uh, health crisis, uh, has had already an impact on disarmament and arms control issue. Uh, some governments have used this period uh, when people's attention was focusing on the pandemic to increase the military tension, to increase the trade of weapons, um, and uh, to increase also the, you know, the, the uh, the, the improvement of their weapon with, for example, the uh, missile test uh, of North Korea and the US testing the uh, hypersonic missile. And uh, NATO also has launched the improvement of its nuclear doctrine without any kind of democratic debate. 
But on the other side, the pandemic has pointed the terrible consequences of our global system on people's life and on the environment. Uh, the call of the UN General Secretary for a global ceasefire was uh, and many other in initiatives, including the very active participation of the peace movements, uh, have contributed uh, to raise awareness and develop people's conscience on the need to move away from the old thinking and behavior and to start to build back better. I think that's in every national debate and that's, uh, that's our task to put nuclear weapons in, in this debate. Uh, the pandemic has also drawn to pe people's attention to the failures of national and global healthcare systems. And despite, despite the intense lobbying from military circles, many people realize the absurd waste of nuclear, uh, of military spending. Uh, and when they have the opportunity to do so, uh, there are a lot of support for calls and petitions to ask for shifting the resources. Uh, also the pandemic pointed the link between our actual global ne neoliberal system and its impact on the environment, including on people's health. The critique is now everywhere and the pandemic shows the need of much more international coordination, even at the European level, where more solidarity between states and people is, is needed. So the postponement, the cancellation of many international events did also already impact the necessary democratic and multilateral debate and shows again the importance of uh, multilateral forum and uh, uh, such as the United Nations. So in this period, we are just starting to feel the impact of the pandemic. We're just after, but not really after, because in France it's really um, hitting us back again. Um, I recall the, how the role of movements, movements such as ours is critical to open the space uh, of alternatives and develop uh, a new paradigm of security that is both common for the world, a security that is human and individual, and also environmental to preserve uh, our environment. So let's point the coming crucial benchmarks where we could focus the attention uh, in the coming months in regards to nuclear weapons. Um, so first, uh, this year, uh, with, it is the 70th anniversary of the United Nations and starts the 75th an, uh, session of the United Nations General Assembly on September uh, 15, so four days ago. And the first committee on disarmament and international security is scheduled to meet on October, from October 5 to November 5. Uh, so there will be a lot of restriction and there are uncertainties whether the first committee will uh, uh, will take place and how it will operate. But it is a very important session and the tune of uh, this first general debate after the pandemic will, will say if lessons uh, have been learned uh, by governments or if we are still in the uh, previous uh, uh, pre-pandemic uh, state of mind. But for 2021, I've noted four important events, whereas European, for a nuclear-free uh, Europe, we should mobilize. So the first one is the New START Treaty anniversary. It's on February 5th. This treaty uh, has been quite successful in reducing nuclear weapons between Russia and the US uh, since February 2011. The data shows that the two countries combined have cut 435 strategic launchers, reduced deployed strategic launchers by 263 and reduce the number of deployed uh, strategic warheads by 638. While uh, important um, that warhead reduction, um, it is less than 8% of the estimated uh, warheads remaining in the two countries. But what has been very important is that the inspection, the notification regime and record are been um, are also crucial part of the treaty uh, and because they keep the u.s uh, russian strategic relations um, and they are um, 
uh, they keep them and they keep the dialogue. But as of mid uh, July 2020, the two nations had exchanged more than 20, uh, 20,400 total notification about their arsenal. So that's a lot of dialogues and, and cooperation. But time is now running out for the new start with only a little five months remaining before it expires. Um, and the uh, recent bilateral talks did not deliver much since the US seemed to want to involve China in the treaty as a prerequisite. And, and change the whole term of the treaty. So I, I think that we should stress that Russia and the United States should extend the next, the new START treaty at least for the 10 next years, let's say. Um, it's not a treaty that will bring us to zero, but if uh, the new START expires next year, arms control between Russia and the United States, as we know it, uh, will effectively be over. So given the underlying east-west east tensions and upcoming dramatic governance shifts, both in the US and Russia, uh, this appears uh, to be little interest available on either side in negotiating a new and important treaty. So uh, let's build on what we have, that's my suggestion, and keep the new START treaty alive uh, until the conditions uh, for better uh, disarmament treaty are met. The second next important uh, meeting or benchmark is the NPT review conference. We've been speaking about that. IPB family and many other movements have prepared uh, this uh, session that should have occurred in uh, April this year, uh, but it's really a unique uh, opportunity for the, at least for the Hibakusha to transmit their fight against A and H bomb. And we do not know yet uh, when it would take place. Uh, but it will be a cr crucial moment to raise a debate in Europe and point the danger of nuclear weapons. So um, we don't think the NPT will bring us to zero, but it is the only uh, you, almost universal a place where uh, nuclear disarmament is uh, discussed and it is a good place for civil society also to raise awareness and to raise our voice. So, of course, we will be there uh, by any means, uh, however, um, whatever it takes place. Um, and uh, we will use this opportunity to, to make some noise and uh, point uh, as a it would say it was said this morning the TPNW as a necessary complementary instrument of the NPT. The next, uh, my third, as not really a benchmark or a date, but it's the fight against nuclear weapons on European soil. And Ludo uh, spoke about it, and I think it is really a good point that he made, saying that. Um, uh, Nuclear, this uh, attempt to renew uh, the nuclear weapons in, on the European soil is a very good opportunity to raise awareness about the fact that they should leave uh, and um, that it's, there is no point by renewing them. So I won't develop that more, but we also want to speak about um, the nuclear policy of NATO in, in, in this regard um, and uh, denounce it because um, uh, nuclear weapon, uh, you know, Jessica Koss, the, the new director of the nuclear policy of NATO said nuclear weapons have been the foundation of NATO's collective security since its inception. It's absolutely not true. There is no mention of nuclear weapons uh, in the charter. Uh, so they have tried to tight uh, the allies and the allies have left themselves being tight by these uh, agreements. Uh, but um, let's, let's debunk our, um, uh, nuclear weapons from NATO and uh, say that wherever, um, where, whatever NATO policies are, we don't want it to be nuclear even if we, by another side, criticize uh, the military alliance. Uh, same with the French and the UK nuclear weapons. How can we be more um, solid and be more effective in uh, supporting the UK and, 
um, French campaigns. And in regards to the Russian uh, nuclear weapons, uh, how can we be more efficient also in helping and supporting the movements there that are denouncing the uh, nuclear uh, policies of, the, of Russia? So that's really on the table and, and that's on our mind. The next and last point I wanted to make is the TPNW. Of course, it's a game changer in the nuclear weapons world and the attempt to isolate and stigmatize the nine nuclear processors uh, is bearing fruit, really bearing fruit. The uh, recent ratification from Ireland, the signature from Malta, show that there are no blocked situation even in Europe and much more, more and more people and states are convinced. So the treaty, as we said, is only six countries far from entering into force. Um, it will soon gather 50 signatures. And I think we should um, yeah, really adopt what has been uh, suggested this morning that the date, we, we, of course, we will know when it will have 50 signatures. So the entry into force will be 90 days after. So let's make sure that we will um, organize uh, an enormous celebration everywhere in all cities. I don't know, with, with towns, with, yeah, uh, all organizations. I, I think it's really a meeting point and, and the, the opening of a next period where we can attack financial institutions and, um, and companies uh, building nuclear weapons and, and really stigmatize even more the nine nuclear processors. So I think we have quite good points and levers in front of us to build a movement. We are just at the very start of that. I fully agree with the first uh, important suggestion that Ludo made that uh, we should first make sure that we um, uh, get uh, to, to involve uh, a, a very broad and large community of organization in this movement, uh, much further than the peace movement. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to give the floor to... So this could be an agreement. Then I would like to ask maybe you and me, preparing for the next event three or four suggestions for webinars. There were mentioned different webinars, including an information webinar, maybe about Büchel, Fast Lane, uh, the Italian military bases, because we know who knows about the nuclear weapons military bases in Italy. So if there was mentioned one to the European nuclear weapons, France, Belgium, P3 countries, Germany included. So this could be, so coming to the next meeting with a list of three, four webinars, which could be starting at the end of the year and continue in, in spring time. That could be also a part, a, a concrete step forward for our activities. Then having in mind that I think Ayel should take the lead, preparing the party to the TPNW but if the end of the when we have the 50s countries ratifying it, you know, I think Ayel is next very much connected to uh, ICANN, so maybe develop together or independently or in discussion with ICANN for the next meeting one or two suggestions how we can online and offline and worldwide celebrate this event and I think we also include our international organizations. It could be interesting for ITUC, definitely very high line interest for IPB. I think it's also from a big interest for Pax Custody. So we really when we bring all these international organizations together, then we can really have a big worldwide party. So let's think about it and hopefully Ariel can come with some suggestions to our next meeting and then we can decide about it. So for me, this meeting was on one side a start meeting, but also a preparatory meeting for decisions at the next meeting. So the next meeting from my point of view has shortly introduction to the different homework we were giving to this different people and then discuss these suggestions and decide about it. Because I, I think it's a little bit too early to make too many decisions for actions today. We need a little bit more common work and common discussions. 
So now I'm looking to, I have different papers. This makes it a little bit more difficult that I have to look at, but I think I put together the most uh, important points. And when you agree, the coordinating committee will have a meeting and invite in about six weeks, and then we can have our next meeting. That will be my summary for today. Let me add two points which you definitely should do. I absolutely agree that we need a mailing list. So the best point is everyone who is joining this meeting, and I think will send us her or their mailing address. We have the mailing addresses from the first meeting. And who is the coordinating committee? You can see on the website. There are the members of the committee mentioned. Uh, then we can put the mailing list together and uh, prepare the events for next year. And, you know, from my understanding, we, we are not an alternative to national meetings. The language is always a problem, but I think we can have a quite interesting exchange between different European countries over some political questions and also some action, locations of activities. So I would stay for European webinars, even when not everyone can join every webinar. Maybe we can take some information home to our German or other activities, translate them for them and bring, give them to, the, to our colleagues. But I think the European and international exchange is absolutely important. And I personally know quite nothing about the Italian military bases, nuclear military bases, and would love to know more about it. So let's, let's start and develop some of these webinars and let's see if they are workable. If not, we can stop it. But I think we should start with it. Okay. Anyone wants to? It's all work in progress, isn't it? So, but it has been really a very interesting um, meeting. I thought it would be long, but in fact, I've, I've enjoyed <laughs> each minute of it. So I thank you all very much. Um, and we keep on working as we can with this pandemic. It means through uh, digital means and. But it's great to have, uh, yeah, to have these conversations anyway. So Joseph is pointing that Zoom uh, conferencing system has a simultaneous interpretation yeah. function. So maybe we can use it. I have no experience with it, but it, it could be a good uh, way to exchange and have more people. And really, I, I'm like Rainer. I would like very much to have a, a, a briefing, a deep briefing on what is happening in this or uh, this country in regards to nuclear weapons. And I think it will be very helpful to, you know, to circulate this knowledge and not just think in our national functions. Anyway, uh, maybe it's time to say thank you and, and goodbye. And thank you to uh, Eskil to have taken care of all the system and to everyone who was there. And uh, yeah, so we meet in six weeks. And um, we don't have a date. Do we have a date? Let's check the date because the autumn is quite overcrowded. Let us discuss this a little bit between us. Okay. Uh, Ludo, you want to say something? Oh, I thought according to the agenda that Tom also wants to say concluding remarks. I don't know. <laughs> he starts. He made the first. <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. Rana did this last time. He goes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, well. We keep in touch. Thank you. Have a nice bye -bye. weekend. Bye-bye. 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 Have a good bye. weekend.